Welcome, 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 my friends. Welcome to Code Lab on Tinker Live. This is the show that helps students and teachers make and create with Tinker Code. Uh, we are very excited today. This is an exciting day uh, because we have uh, some special guests with us. Today is also day two of Computer Science Education Week. And for many of us, that means it's Hour of Code. Uh, now, yesterday, we built a mission patch with one of t NASA's top designers, but today we have not one, but two of NASA's in, uh, aerospace engineers. Uh, so in the next 40 minutes, uh, we are going to, um, here, let me go ahead and share this with you. In the next 40 minutes, we are going to be joined by these awesome people, Emily Judd and Paul Kessler. Uh, we are also going to be going through the, uh, the Lunar Module Project, uh, and they're going to be walking us through and telling us a little bit about what goes into uh, a great project like this. Uh, and we are also going to be joined by one of our uh, uh, Tinker Specialists who's going to walk us through this project uh, so you guys know exactly how to do this. Uh, and we are also uh, going to give you guys a chance to ask questions, so you can ask questions of our uh, special guest, you can ask questions of our NASA uh, guests, of our Tinker uh, specialists. Uh, and so you can also put those questions right now in the live chat. Uh, so you can go to go tinker slash live chat uh, and submit your questions now so that we can do this uh, at the end of uh, at the end of the show. So um, so get ready. Are you ready? I'm really getting excited. So uh, so let's move on. And, and I just want to introduce myself because I am Daniel Rizak. Uh, I am a former science teacher and STEM person. Wait, that's not me. There I am. Um, and uh, tech coach. And, and uh, I've worked with students and science uh, um, my whole career. Uh, and I'm really excited because Tinker is uh, um, always uh, a great place to do Hour of Code. So I hope you guys are doing Hour of Code this week. Now this week, this, uh, this day, we are doing uh, the Build a Lunar Habitat project. Today's lesson. And so the agenda for today is we're going to kind of get to know our guests in just a moment. Uh, we're gonna walk through that project. They're gonna help us understand what, a, what you know, scientific principles we should be looking at for the lunar habitat. Uh, then we're gonna create, we're gonna walk you through that lesson and then we're gonna have time for uh, questions and answers. So a um, couple of fun things. So if you uh, notice my fun little virtual background here, we're gonna give you guys a chance to uh, have access to six amazing Tinker backgrounds. Uh, that'll be at the end of the show. I'll make sure you get those resources. Um, and uh, there's a great, uh, there's six of those. You can use them if you, if you like to have that kind of stuff. Uh, so again, don't forget, Tinker, uh, go tinker slash live chat, that's G-O-T-Y-N dot K-R slash live chat uh, to submit your questions for our, uh, our NASA specialists. So let's get started, all right? I wanna make sure everyone's on the right page uh, before we get to our guests so that you are logged in, you know where the project is, and there's a couple ways to do that. Uh, and so let's show you how to do that. We're going to, first of all, if you want to save your work, uh, it's good to be signed into Tinker, okay? So there's a couple of ways uh, we can get to this project, but we're going to go ahead and show you the, the if you have an account, uh, you should sign in at tinker.com. Uh, when you go there, you can sign in as a student. Uh, students, you have a few different ways of, of signing in. So uh, you can go and sign in with a Tinker account, a Google account, or you can use the Tinker Smart Pass. Now, once you do that, you can then go to your classes and the Hour of Code projects reside right inside your class. We've put that folder there for everybody uh, so that you have easy access to today's project. Uh, so in that, you're going to click on the NASA tab and then you can go right to build a habitat, uh, build a lunar habitat right there uh, to kind of get ready for, uh, for the project today. Um, once you click uh, there, there's, there's also another way to get there. If you just go to tinker.com slash NASA, uh, you can have access to that. But I do recommend always try to sign in if you can. Uh, that way you can save your work. Uh, so that does bring us to our special guests today. All right. So we have two uh, very special guests and they have so much knowledge to share with us. Uh, but we are going to first introduce um, uh, Emily Judd. Uh, Emily Judd is an aerospace engineer. Uh, she, with the, let me get this right, Space Mission Ana Analysis Branch at the NASA Langley Research Center. 
NASA folks have the longest titles. It's amazing because uh, they have a lot of responsibility. Uh, as a space systems engineer, she works to design and analyze space missions and spacecraft to support human exploration and robotic science. In addition to her scientific work, uh, Miss Judd enjoys performing with orchestral groups, which is great because if you're going to be a, a scientist, you don't want to lose that artistic side of yourself, right? Uh, she also studied at University of Central Florida and University of Michigan. She has a master's degree there. Uh, and we also are going to be joined here in just a second by Paul Kessler, also an aerospace engineer uh, who went to University of Colorado. Paul is an aerospace engineer working for the Systems Analysis and Concepts Directorate at NASA Langley Research Center. Uh, he works on human exploration and space flight developing lunar surface architectures, transport, and surface habitat design. So this is exactly what, what we would hope for to do this lesson today uh, and performing mission analysis. So uh, welcome, welcome, Emily and uh, Paul. Welcome to Code Lab. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Good to see you. Hi, Paul. Uh, Emily, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Really excited to, to get started with this activity today. All right. I have your audio, but I don't have you uh, your video. Okay. There we go. Oh, so good. <laughs> uh, well, welcome to see you uh, face to face. Um, this is an exciting project. Uh, we have like seven of these NASA projects for Hour of Code. Uh, but there's some, you know, what's nice about this week is that we get to really talk and get some insight into the science behind um, behind these projects. So we're really uh, we're really excited to have you guys uh, here today. Um, so maybe Emily, maybe you can start uh, with us here, uh, kind of just give us an idea of like what your role is and how that might kind of tie into uh, lunar modules and maybe the projects you're currently working on. Um, sure. Yeah. So uh, recently I have been working on human exploration projects to both the moon and Mars. So the whole moon to Mars thing, that's me. Um, in particular for the lunar aspect, I have been working on the human landing system. So this is the vehicle that will take the astronauts from going in orbit around the moon down to the surface of the moon and then back up again. So it's kind of that last little leg of getting to the moon and back. Um, and so we've been working with some commercial partners on their designs sure. um, to see how we can best accomplish that task. Awesome, and, and Paul, what about you? What, describe your role a little bit more. Yeah, so <clears throat> one of the things that I am doing is working with um, a bunch of contractors that are actually trying to develop habitats for in space and on the lunar surface. And these habitats would be used to carry astronauts to Mars uh, or of course house them on the surface of the, of the moon. And in these contracts, I'm, I'm helping serve technical roles in that and helping to communicate those requirements to and from NASA. I'm also helping in the development of our baseline design for NASA for the lunar surface as, as well as for those habitats to go to Mars. And uh, I also function as a lead for a lunar architecture team that is working on the, the lunar surface and what kind of things would be done on the lunar surface, including habitation, living, and other things when we're at a, a sustained presence on the moon. So you guys could probably uh, explain this better, but um... I guess our, our goal, if I'm right with our with the mission to Mars, is we have to go to m the moon first. Is that right? Yep, yeah, we'll we be want using to. The... Go, ahead. go ahead, Emily. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we'll be using the moon as kind of a, a practice for, for going to Mars. So with the new technologies and new vehicles that we're developing, um, that way we can test them at a place that's a little bit closer to home in case uh, you know something does go wrong, then it's a lot easier to get back from the moon than it is when you're all the way out at Mars. Right, um, right, right. So a lot, of, a lot of cool new technologies to try and test out. And then we're also going to be exploring new areas of the moon that we didn't get to see as part of the Apollo program. Gotcha. 
Yeah, and it's, it's also really important that we understand that the moon is about 250,000 miles away, which is, which is quite a bit. In fact, I, I think I've, been, I've, I've looked up before that all the planets in our solar system could fit between the Earth and moon. So it is, it is quite a long ways as well. Huh. But uh, when you're trying to go to Mars, you're talking about two and a half million miles. So you're talking to an order of magnitude more. And, and the challenges that you face in going to Mars and going to the moon are a little bit different. But some of the things that are the same definitely are the getting on the surface and, and being able to operate on a surface. And mm -hmm. the, the advantage that you have with the moon is that you have a little bit less uh, d delay in your communication. So if you were to communicate from Mars, there are moments where you could spend uh, 45 minutes waiting for that communication to get back and forth between the ones communicating and, and the ground station. And when you're on the moon, you're, you're talking about uh, seconds to uh, minutes. So are we right in that we will actually be needing uh, a lunar habitat uh, in, in preparation for our mission to Mars? Or uh, um, is that actually something that, that we're going to be needing? Yeah, in order to prepare for Mars, you have to have the same sort of systems that you're going to be dealing with on the sure. moon so that you can actually test out those systems and make sure that you can operate in those environments and any lessons learned that you gain from that. So landing a large habitat on the moon is, is one aspect to that and being able to perform the different science functions that you want to be able to do, as well as the li having the living capability that you're going to need on Mars is, is an important factor. What's our timetable, Emily? When are we gonna When are we make, gonna get to Mars? We have all this practice well, we have to do first, right? <laughs> yeah. So we're looking to get back to the moon uh, first in 2024, and then there will be uh, not quite annual missions, but about annual missions back to the moon in, in preparation. And then we're looking at uh, sending out the first Mars mission um, as early as the 2030s. Okay, so it's like just around the corner. So that's good. <laughs> it's getting closer. So uh, I believe you guys have, uh, you want to walk us through a little bit um, of basically what goes into kind of lunar module design. I don't know that kind of, maybe that's not your question, but that's the one I put up there anyway. Um, and uh, you had a, a little bit of uh, something you wanted to share, right, Paul? Yeah. We can go ahead and share that. All right. So um, here we go. You just kind of point me in the right direction. Sure. <laughs> Provoke discussion. Yeah. Disclaimer. That's disclaimer. disclaimer. We can move, move to the next one. All right. So the, the idea here is to give you an idea about what habitat design entails, especially in terms of the interior aspect of the design of the habitat, because uh, you're going to be living there. You're probably going to be doing science if, if that's one of your objectives. It depends on what your objectives are. Mm -hmm. But either way, that you, you need to have all the systems that are necessary with you. This becomes an extreme challenge when you're, you're trying to go to Mars because you need to carry all of those supplies to and back from Mars that you're going to need on the way there and back. And that includes any sort of repair items or things like that. But if you imagine yourself being in any of these, these habitats, you, you'd likely maybe wake up get yourself ready to go uh, to maybe go have a little bit of a uh, breakfast or something like that. You'd leave your sleeping quarters and in zero gravity environments, you'd float down maybe to the galley and you'd find yourself something to, to put together. But as you go down there, you definitely pass lots of bags that are holding supplies, maybe wires and laptops just kind of dangling out there. And then, and then you'd be able to make your breakfast and you'd, think to yourself, wow, this is, a, this is an amazing trip, right? We're in an amazing place. Uh, but at the same time, you've got to keep yourself alive. Everything that you need, oxygen, water, uh, food supplies, even the bathroom, they all better be functioning because you're going to be a little bit perturbed if they're not. And there's, there's always some risks involved with that. So you're going to spend a lot of your day uh, here. We're, we're seeing a, an astronaut at a galley table. You're going to spend some of your day certainly eating but you're gonna use a lot of these same functions, maybe like a galley table to do other things like sit down with your fellow astronauts, have a conversation about what the work is for the day or prepare for any sort of maintenance activities that you need to do, or even just to have a little bit of entertainment. You're gonna find a lot of the furniture is gonna be like that. If you go to the next slide. Yeah. 
And, and here we can see that there's in, in front of us, we see a medical workstation. You're going to need to bring medical supplies too. If somebody gets injured or there's some sort of harm that's, that's caused doing maybe an EVA or anything else, you want to be able to help fix yourselves, not just your systems, but your human body, keep yourself happy and healthy. And another thing there is you could see the, the person on a, a sort of um, a machine try to do some exercise. You're going to have to make sure that you're exercising and keeping yourself really strong and fit, uh, especially for these missions, especially if you're in zero G. But the same thing happens when you're in, when I say zero G, I'm saying we're in microgravity situations, you're able to float around. Well, even on the moon, you have a, a sixth of the gravity of earth. And in that gravity, you're not, you're not, there's not as much pulling down on you as, as you would have, let's say on earth. And so bones don't need to be as strong and muscles don't need to be as strong. And so your body may just say, Hey, I don't need to worry about that. It's kind of like going to the gym and trying to lift some weights. You mm -hmm. lift heavier weights if you want to get stronger and you have to keep doing that. Otherwise you're just, you're kind of weight. Your, your muscles aren't going to stay that, that strong. So the same we, thing we happens here uh, on the lunar Our bodies weren't designed for, for that kind of gravity, right? That's right. And, and like what's so wonderful about human innovation is our bodies weren't designed to swim under the ocean either. Our bodies weren't designed to fly in the air. So we find some way to do that. And so there's the same sort of thing, but we have to account for those types of things. If you go to the next slide. Sure. You could see with all these square white bags there, those are all the supplies that might be need to be stored. So again, what I said is we got to store not only the systems that we need to, that recycle our air, that clean out the carbon dioxide out of our air or to produce more oxygen that we're gonna need. Uh, we also have all of the supplies like food, clothing, uh, wipes if you need wipes, uh, personal items, and all of the things that need to be used for repairing any sort of items. And we have to make sure that those are with us. So it's just like having a nice house, except that you have to repair your house a lot. And if, if anybody's had a house, then you know what it's like to, uh, having to do that. Uh, go uh, to the next one. Sure. And this is just an example of ISS before and after. We see ISS nice, pristine when we've set it up, put it out there. But then afterwards, we've got to get these things out. We've got to get easy access to all of these things. And we need to be able to perform the functions that we need. And so it can look a little bit messier. So one of the things that we think about uh, when we're designing these habitats is how we're gonna uh, store the supplies that we need. We think about including all the systems that we need in order to survive. And we wanna have the ability to not only just do work, but we also have to be able to have fun as well because we need to keep our, our mental health up as well. And I know that can be a challenge sometimes, especially in, in this, uh, this current climate to, right. to do that, we want to make sure that the same sort of thing can be there. You're isolated. You can feel very isolated. You're you're effectively quarantined from the rest of the world on a different planet, and so it can be a little daunting. And so you want to make sure to to manage that. Now, on the lunar surface, to keep in mind as well, when we're designing floors and other things like that, when you're in one six G, uh, you, you imagine taking your body weight and dividing it by uh, one sixth. And what you find is uh, when, you, when you divide it into that sixth of what your body weight is, you're, you don't weigh very much. And if you don't weigh very much, it's easy to jump. And so that's amazing and fun if you were gonna be a basketball player on the moon, I guess, mm. uh, yeah. and you weren't very good on earth. But it also could be a problem if you're walking around and it's easy to just kind of bang your head on something above you. So if you need to have additional floors, you need to take that into consideration too. That is interesting. So I want to kind of like uh, ask both of you, we kind of go, this is really great because now as we kind of get into the project phase, um, I've made a little bit of a list and Emily, you, you know, you can kind of add to it, but kind of what we need, right? I made a few items and you can, you can add to this list. So we need, we definitely need to store supplies, right? Um, we also want to have fun because we want to, you know, be able to have, uh, we, we, it needs to be a space where our mental health can, uh, you know, can thrive. Um, keep in mind that we have one six gravity. Uh, what else are kind of like the top five, six things that, that students need to keep in mind when they're, uh, uh, when they're thinking of this? Yeah, so I would say one of the big ones is um, crew quarters. So you wanna have a place where the astronauts can go sleep. They can go 
you know, Skype call their, their families back, back home on earth, um, a place where they can write their emails. Um, then we also will have like the science workstations where they can do some of their experiments inside. And then a big one um, is that they will need uh, an area to get ready for their spacewalks. So they'll need a space where they can um, get into their space suits, kind of get their bodies adjusted for the different environment. Um, because we actually use different levels of oxygen um, and different pressures inside the spacesuits versus what your um, cabin would be. So it takes the human body a little bit of time to adjust to that. Right. So they would need that area. Um, so those those would so be some that, of the is big that like ones. A pressure, would, like a pressurized area or something like that? Uh, or, uh, yeah, so you'd have like the little airlock that is, airlock, um, right. you know, how you actually get in and out of the vehicle. Um, but then you can crawl into the suits and then once you put your helmet on and everything's all sealed up, then you can just do that process there. Got it. So I'm making this, I got an airlock, right? We have crew quarters. We've got a place where we can play games, maybe. Um, we've got exercise area. That's important. Um, all right. This is, this, is, this is good. This is good. Now we're going to bring in our tinker specialist uh, to kind of help. And, you're, and I'm going to tell you, Mr. Lockhart, as you get in here, uh, you are going to have to put all these things into your project. I'm just going to tell you right now. I, I will try. I will do my best effort there. But uh, let me just real introduce you real quick. This is Mr. Lockhart. If any of you guys are, you know, Tinker users, you've probably talked with him or been trained by him. Uh, he's a former teacher, former tech coach. He is kind of our master Tinker trainer. Uh, and uh, you can always catch him on Twitter or you can, I even put his email address there. So if you have any questions about Tinker, just educator support at tinker.com. He's super responsive. So, so a good, a good point there. I did notice in the chat, one or two teachers that were asking questions. If sure. you have, if you're a teacher who needs some help on like how to use Tinker or something's going wrong there, or you just need anything there, use that email address there. Okay. All right. Um, I'll just throw that up one more time. It's educator support at tinker.com goes right to Mr. Lockhart. Uh, so Mr. Lockhart, you're gonna walk us through this project and I'm just gonna sure. do, just so you know, I might have a couple moments where I just kind of say, okay, stop. Uh, because I, you know, as we, we go down the list of all the things that you know, we're supposed to have now, uh, this might be, uh, there might be some questions uh, that Paul and Emily uh, can, can, uh, can add. Perfect. I'm trying to think of the science. Per so. No, absolutely. That's perfect. And the beauty of this project, like some of our, like even the project from yesterday, and this one especially, is that this is very open-ended. It's about you being creative, going and putting in what you want. You can go and draw what you want in here. And so we'll show you a couple of tips with that front, but mm -hmm. then we can kind of talk through the science and you can add some of those other kind of um, things as we go. And really, when you get into this project, Really, the biggest thing to do here to start is just click next on the tutorial because this is going to take you to what we call our stage. Now, our stage, the goal of the stage is that you can do a lot, a little bit more graphic design really easily in here and kind of build towards kind of platforming games, kind of like Super Mario style games. You can do that here. There's all kinds of pieces and there's some kind of special code that comes with a couple of the um, a couple of with the, a couple of the actors as well. And so when I get into this stage, obviously, if we're in space, this white background is probably not the best one. We can change it to a lot of things, but we'll just change it to gray for now. And it's kind of a kind of a planety looking gray. So we'll start there. Sure. And then the key is that over here on the left side, you have all kinds of things that you can add to this environment. And so as you build, the whole idea of this project is that you can kind of open it, it, build your own lunar habitat. And so we can take some of the graphics that Tinker already has out for you, and you can just drag them in from the bottom into this project. So I can come over here, I can drag in this uh, kind of vegetation lab, I can drag in this other lab as well. And then talking about some of the things um, that Paul spoke of is if there's a graphic that's not there that you wanna add as well, is you can always come over here to the coding side of this. So if I click up here at the top and I hit code and I hit add actor, 
I can always draw, I can either draw it or I can upload real pictures. There's all kinds of ways you can add stuff into this. And so if I come back over to that stage, it's again, the switchers up here at the top where it says code and stage. Mm -hmm. I can also add other pieces as well. So I can add a crater. Um, there is a, there's a couple of other things in here too, where I can add a satellite dish. Um, we'll put it up there, even though that's a bit off screen, I can add a solar panel in here. And again, it's, you can build whatever you want in here. There's all kinds of things you can add and pieces you can add as well. And then I think the key, and we'll kind of code, show a little bit of code, but I'll let you kind of ask some questions um, before we do that, sure. is that up here in this smiley face, we also have a rover that you could add to the project. And we'll do a little bit more with the rover in the project tomorrow. But if I add the rover, what it actually does is that when I flip back over to the code, and this is where the stage editor gets really cool, and I'm actually just going to fit to the code library, I have a special rover category of blocks to make this really easy to make the rover move and do a couple of other things as well. All right. So I'm going to say, okay, stop there for just a minute, because I had to, I do have a few questions um, that uh, Paul and Emily can definitely add. So just in that thought, uh, I'm, I was thinking about how are we creating energy? Because um, the solar panel thing was interesting, but uh, what what other aspects should we be uh, thinking about when we're building this? So how are we doing that exactly? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Emily, did Emily, you want to take up? You want to jump on that? Uh, sure. Yeah, so I think on the lunar surface, um, we will have some solar panels in use for sure. Uh, there is also, um, you know, and we can use those to charge up our batteries for um, if we're in a location where the sun will go down mm -hmm. um, and then that will give us power then overnight. Um, gotcha. So yeah, so that would kind of be like the main basic energy source um, and Paul, will there be like a, is there like a, you know, basically, uh, is there any sort of like generator or something like that, that will be, uh, you know, there or, uh, um, converting, you know, so I've, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, um, there's a, yeah. there's power conversion and distribution as a part of the systems for a habitat. And when you're generating that power, it's generating from the solar, uh, the, the solar, um, array which is gathering the sun's energy. Uh, but we also have other options that are outside of that. That's really the standard way we would go is use solar arrays, use batteries, or recharge those up and, and then use those batteries in periods where we don't have sunlight. Big but bad. there's also other things like, like nuclear power. You could mm -hmm. use fission power or you could use regenerative fuel cells or mm -hmm. fuel cells. So regenerative right. fuel cells, would they would split hydrogen and oxygen out of the water and utilize that for developing energy. So, oh yeah. Wow. Okay. Cause I know we do use mm -hmm. nuclear power in a lot of our probes and the things that we send out uh, so they can stay alive for so long. Right. Um, right. And so the other, one other thing that David brought up there was a, there was like a, there was like a greenhouse. Is that something or would we, would uh, astronauts be growing th their own food on, uh, on the moon? I think with regards to food and growing food, it's always good to have it as supplemental nutrition if we can afford to put it on because everybody likes to have fresh greens or fresh herbs or fresh vegetables that they can do it. But really in order to sustain humans off the land, you need a lot of land in order to do that. So usually it's really a supplemental to our diet. Gotcha. Uh, to keep in mind that you, you also, another thing to think about in terms of food is that we don't want to just have all of the freeze dried stuff, the, the ice cream that you get that astronaut ice cream. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to eat a bunch of astronaut ice cream all day long, every day for a number of days. You, you also want to have some frozen foods and other things that you can heat up and actually enjoy, not just those types of foods. So those are really good, especially for the mental health part of it and the nutritive sure. value that they have. Got it. So David, why don't you go ahead and, and continue and uh, let's, uh, let's see the next stages of creation for uh, the lunar habitat. 
All right, let me go and make sure I can share the right screen again. There you All go. right, so I think when you look at the next stages here is you can add all kinds of things in here. And so for, as an example, if I wanted to come and add just a astro, I want it, and he'll be a little bit, cause I'm going to use one of our pre-built astronauts. He'll be a little bit kind of a futuristic looking, but if I wanted to add an astronaut in here that has animation already in here that I can program and code, I can just go into the character builder and I can add him. And so now I have a person too. And the whole idea is that you've kind of built, you can build up this kind of lunar habitat. And let me go and pull this out a little bit. So it's a little bit bigger so you can see it. Right. Um, and you can build up this whole lunar habitat and then you can build some interaction in. And so like for, it, for as an example, one of the interactions that you can build is really simple is to get the Rover because it has some of that code already built to get the Rover moving. And so one of the easiest ways to kind of move devices in any kind of video game is to use your arrow keys. And so I'm just gonna get this event block that says when up arrow pressed. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually gonna go over here and I'm just gonna say, all right, I wanna point the, the rover in a, right in a certain direction. And there, it's actually really, really easy to do. There's just a block that says point rover up. So up arrow press to point rover up. And right. then I'm gonna say, move the rover. And so now if I press play on this project and I start pressing the up arrow up, the rover can move. And what's really neat about something like the rover in kind of our level editor, stage editor, is there's also places where you can go and you can add, the rover can take a picture, he can do all kinds of other things. And then I think the other kind of key here with this is that you want to make the, the things like the lab, you want to make them static where like if we run the rover, we run the actor into those, they're not going to like just go over them as a graphic. And so one of the things that you can do is you can actually use some physics blocks, which gets into like, the, and you can do this all kinds of different ways where I can add physics blocks into my project. And really you could even add, you could start to really talk about gravity where you can set the gravity here as well. And then all you have to do to get it to where like this crater is not, um, is not something that the rover can run over is that if I come down here to this large crater, I'm just gonna basically set this where this is an, where it's an active piece, where it's an active piece, where if I come down to the physics blocks, there's the set active and static blocks. Mm -hmm. And I can use those and say true. And now when the rover runs into it, it's not gonna go run over it. So it's not gonna just run over that crater. And you can do it with the habitats as well. And again, this is a creative open-ended project that you can manipulate in all kinds of different ways. And I think as you think about this, the kind of base level is to go and create the buildings and create what it looks like. And then can you actually take it and tell a story with it? Can you take it and program it and inter some interaction in it as well? That's great. Yeah. And so you're going to have, you know, and, and from, from our, uh, uh, from Emily and Paul, we're also going to have, you know, we're going to have an airlock. We're going to have a farm maybe, you know, or <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have a, um, a game room. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, there are some questions I have, and uh, there are some questions that are already being uh, um, shared in the Q&A. So we're going to go ahead and go over to our Q&A uh, because we have some questions there uh, for our NASA friends. So let me share that for you. There we go. So let us move to our Q&A portion. Um, you, either of you can take this. Uh, when do you think there will be a population on Mars? Can we build a city there? Is that the goal? So I would say uh, from, an... go, go ahead, Emily, Paul. Go ahead. Emily, go ahead. Okay. Emily. <laughs> um, so from a NASA perspective, our, our goal is to go out and explore, but then we always want to bring our astronauts back. So, our goal is not really to, um, you know, build up a large city on Mars, but some of the commercial companies are looking more at that direction. Um, one of the big challenges about building any sort of large surface infrastructure on Mars is that for one, it's so far away as Paul mentioned, and we have to bring everything with us. 
pretty much, and unless we can figure out a way to use some of the resources that are already on Mars, um, you know, like could we use some of the dirt in order to make bricks or something like that to help out with the surface infrastructure? Um, so it's going to be a big challenge if you want to do something like that, just because of the sheer amount of of things that you would have to bring with you. And Paul, you did you want like to add to that? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. The, I, I agree. That's, that's exactly what we're looking at, Emily. I, I think in order to build a population of any significant size, it's going to require, I think, a lot more of that, what we call uh, the, the utilization or the use of things that are already on the planet as much as possible, because taking all those things costs a lot of money and it requires a lot of launches. And there's always risks when you have to land new things. Every time you have to land, there's a risk that's, that's a, uh, that's inherent about that. A anytime if you've gone on uh, an airplane, the most dangerous part of the flight is the takeoff and the landing. So the same thing applies to, to any other planetary body. And now that might not be danger to necessarily to the humans. It could be danger to the equipment that you want to bring with you. So can we build a city there? Yeah, I think we can. I think it's going to take many, many years to do that. Uh, but then again, you could be surprised. I mean, understanding and predicting how quickly we can have that sort of change on Mars is really a function a lot of who's involved and what kind of things we've learned uh, by that time. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. This is a, this, these are great questions from, uh, from these students. So how long will it take? How long does it take to build a rocket? Which rocket has gone the furthest? Well, that's a good, that's a good question. Do either of you know this? <laughs> well, well it, my, it depends my... on who's building the rocket, right? Uh, if it, it depends on who's building the rocket and what that rocket is for. And even the size of the rocket, some rockets can be built, uh, and, and it's not just about building it, right? It's about design, development, uh, testing it, and then then actually launching it. So there's there's different timescales depending on the rocket. SpaceX has been doing a, a good job with building rockets uh, pretty fast, uh, and some other companies have, have been working on that as well, like Blue Origin. Uh, but then NASA has as well, but all for uh, slightly different reasons and with a different methodology behind them for building those rockets. Now, which rocket has gone the farthest? Uh, furthest? Um, it's more about the rocket is used to propel the thing that's supposed to go the furthest. So if you look at things like Voyager and what they had to do, there had to be a lot of energy produced to, to launch Voyager and, uh, and other things. So right. uh, I don't know if I have the, uh, the answer to that. Go ahead, Emily. Yeah, I mean, I would say, it, yeah, with the rockets, it's more about they're, they're trying to push something. The rocket itself is not taking you to the full destination. It's more of like giving you that initial oomph at the start. Um, so yeah, I mean, currently the, the two farthest things we have are the, the Voyager 1 and 2 that have actually passed outside of our solar system, which is really cool. Yeah, But no, they that have is... also been flying for like 40 years too. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's really exciting just to hear that they're, they just like what reconnected with uh, Voyager 2, I think, um, yeah. after like a hiatus. Yeah, because they're, they're, they've been going for so long. It's like even, even their nuclear power is starting to, to wear out. So they can't have all the instruments powered up at the same time. So they kind of have to pick what gets to run based on the limited power that is available now. Yeah, and, and even with things like Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 and a lot of these uh, space-faring vehicles is that you get that oomph from the launch vehicle at a particular time, but then they're trying to match up their trajectory, their path in space such that they can use other planets. And Voyager 1 and 2 had to do this with regards to maybe like Jupiter, Saturn, and others to help gravity assist them to get even faster and to go the distance that they want to go. And those are nuclear too, I think, right? They have a new, don't they have nuclear power? That's correct. That's it. And that, cause it lasts for, for a long time. So we have a, uh, one and more also, question. It's also good do. for, it's also good for when you're really far from the sun and you don't have as much solar power. That is a really 
a good thing. I, I honestly, I wouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't have thought about that. I know they're thinking of other ways now of powering ion propulsion and things like that. And uh, I've heard and read about, uh, I think we have one time for one more question. Uh, but somebody wants to work at NASA and wants to know if there's a job for athletes, uh, for athletic people. And what would that be exactly? Yeah, I mean, I would say one of my good friends is, at, is actually the fitness center director here at Langley. So she's in charge of organizing all the group fitness classes, making sure that the gym is running, all of that types of things. Um, then there are also actually like scientific jobs that require some amount of athletic fitness. So like at the Johnson Space Center in the neutral buoyancy lab, which is basically a really, really large pool, mm -hmm. um, they actually have scuba divers that help as the astronauts are going through their training underwater. So that would be another big thing that I could think of. That's a really good point, right? You need to prepare, you know, they need to be in very good shape, right, astronauts? Um, so you probably need exercise scientists, I guess, in a way, right? Yep. Yep, all yeah, those people definitely... developing the exercises you would do on space. And what, That's what, right. What, they, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, they, I mean, you have to develop the exercise equipment and you have to test it out and you have to do those type of things. So yeah, that's definitely something that NASA works on as well for right. the health of the to, astronauts. I would imagine have to understand and, and uh, help uh, astronauts stay in shape while they're in space too. So there might be some, uh, some need for, uh, for exercise and athletes, uh, exercise scientists and scientists and athletes in, uh, in space as well. Um, I have one little question too. And just when, you, when you're doing the lunar habitat design, is there any thought to using gravity, uh, you know, in like what, what I'm thinking of a, um, uh, I'm missing the term though. What am I thinking of? Uh, on the moon, because it looks like right now some of the lunar habitat is also, uh, uh, is kind of very traditional, you know. Um, is there any thought to kind of increasing gravity or uh, uh, by use, with the design of the module um, and by using a, not a gyroscope, but uh, as, uh, what am I thinking of? Yeah, you're trying to, you're talking about using centri uh, centrifugal, centrifugal force. force. Yeah, and, I mean, because yeah, we've yeah, seen yeah. that in all the space movies, right, where they create basically a centrifuge. Uh, is there any thought of, in, of using a centrifuge to, and, you know, increase that? Um, I don't, I don't know if there's a thought about that. That's usually something that's thought about in space and microgravity situations where you have to, to create that gravity environment. I think on a, a surface like the moon, if you just weigh yourself down really heavy, uh, you're, you're kind of increasing the gravity and actually having the space suit on you, which is quite a bit of mass already is it weighs you down a good, a good deal as well. All right. Well, I want to say thank you. I'm going to do a little wrap up here. We are, uh, uh, it is time for us, uh, time for us to go. Uh, but uh, we have a lot more in store this week with, uh, uh, with our friends at NASA. Um, if you want to see tomorrow's show and you want to see Thursday and Friday, we are uh, bringing on more amazing NASA voices for, uh, for Hour of Code Week this week. Uh, you can add this to your calendar. Everybody go to gotinker slash NASA HOC20. Uh, that is one way to get that in your calendar. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we are doing Lunar Test Drive. Uh, and we have a couple uh, more amazing NASA friends that are joining us, Maria, Melanie Grande and Ryan Joyce. Uh, and I may have Melanie's uh, title wrong, but uh, uh, we had her on before about a year ago, and she was great. Uh, so we're very excited to have them on. Uh, and then also, if you want to have a little more fun with uh, uh, Tinker this week, you can do the Holiday Code Jam. Go to go tinker slash Holiday Code Jam. Uh, and there's you know, chances to take your projects and submit them to, uh, you know, to win prizes and stuff. And I did say I was going to tell you how to get a virtual background for Tinker. You just go to go tinker slash virtual backgrounds and uh, you can have one of those uh, as well. Uh, so again, I just want to say thank you to Emily. Thank you to Paul uh, for joining us today. 
Uh, we've uh, really enjoyed your insights. We always get great feedback and great questions uh, from folks who want to share this experience with their students. Uh, so we really appreciate you, uh, you joining us today. Uh, but uh, that's gonna do it for us today on CodeLab. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>